but it's more about it sounds really lame but kind of how organized the pitch is <laughs> okay. if okay. it's gonna be like obviously like i said sometimes you're trying to get through 100 emails in an hour so <laughs> you learn to skim read yeah. and if a if you've got a pitch that's sort of rambling on i I don't mind it. I think it's really cool. It shows you're passionate. You've got a lot to say about yeah. the artist, but I'm not going to really necessarily have the time to just pick up on it like that. Hi everyone. Welcome back to We Plug Good Music TV. My name is Ayo and you're tuning into a very special edition of our Behind the Music podcast series titled Getting Your Music Heard, where we'll be speaking to music journalists and music editors and finding out how to get press coverage for your music. Today, we're speaking with Sophia Hill, who is a freelance journalist and former editor for New Wave magazine and Guap magazine. Here we go. Sophia, welcome. Um, before we usually start these interviews, I like to do a check-in with our guests. So a quick, how are you doing? How's your year been? How's the summer been so far? All that stuff. Well, this year. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Definitely. Um, this year, it's been all about growth, I think, and okay. just navigating freelance life. Yeah. Um, first real year stepping into it, so oh, wow. getting through the ups and downs. And yeah. Just really exciting year. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That's dope. That's dope. So, um, so, um, f you know, I guess when music journalists get pitched from the artist side or the label side um we don't really you know we we don't really think about what the person we, we don't tend to think too much about what the person on the other side of the email is perhaps going through but like um what is li what is life like as a freelance journalist I think that's a really good question to start on. As I've been saying this for a while, it's an important conversation I think we need to be having more between journalists and press and artists. Um, first of all, it's really strange to be on the other side of the fence and be the one being asked questions, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll do my best to answer. Um, I think the, the main thing is creating more conversations like this and, yeah. and making sure um, we build relationships between each other. Yeah. It's just that kind of thing. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, before we jump into the main conversation today, um, for people that are watching or listening that may be meeting you for the first time, could you give us a bit of a backstory of who Sophia Hill is and how she got here? Well, well, <laughs> um, I think, backstory, uh, I moved to London uh, about six years ago to study anthropology. Okay. And um, that study led me to really, really un start to appreciate and have this passion for communicating people's stories and understanding perspectives, which inevitably kind of le led me to journalism. Nice. And Music journalism just felt like the right path for me because I'm a massive nerd when yeah. it comes to music. Nice. I will talk your ears off for hours <laughs> about it. And yeah, I think music to me is just at the heart of how people communicate as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it just felt like I'm privileged to be in this career, really. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So um, from the time that I have known you, you have been an editor for two publications and you know as you have said now you have been um on the freelance route for uh, for the for the past few months um, but mm. if we're to go back to your time as music editor for new wave and then for guap um can you speak to who your core audiences were and who your music coverage was speaking to? Mm, that's a good question. I think primarily my audience is whoever is willing to learn more about whatever I'm writing about. Okay. Whoever's got that curiosity, that the same curiosity maybe I have to learn about those things. And as an editor, I'd say 
obviously it goes beyond that. It, our audience is, you have to think about how you can tailor your writing and the content that you're producing to your audience. But beyond that, really try and give them um, an opportunity to learn about new things yeah. and, and kind of ignite that same excitement over yeah. these like novel genres or people that yeah. might be up and coming and yeah, yeah. just create an excitement around cool, new artists. Cool. So um, to kind of dig deeper into that a bit so like with so with the case of of new wave and the case of guap when you are forming out that music coverage in terms of what genres of music do you t do, do did you typically cover or was it a wide berth of um artists that could pitch you? Hmm, um, primarily when I first started writing, inevitably I sort of banked on where my passions lay. Yeah. So it was, I think initially it was like with hip hop and rap, any alternative scenes, underground stuff. Yeah. And then from that, I kind of utilized that as a base, a foundation to really, I think, try and show audiences things that they hadn't, maybe don't have access to discover as easily um, and just really try and create conversations around um, newer genres and, yeah. and also break down the idea of actually categorizing um, okay. artists into genres because yeah. I, I'm a strong, uh, it sounds cliche, but I'm a strong believer in not boxing things up okay. Okay. And, and not putting things into categories, especially yeah. an artist who I mean, they're creative. You yeah, don't want to yeah. be boxed up into just one thing or yeah. one format. Yeah. So also having a conversation around that as well okay. is important okay. for me. Awesome, awesome. So, so now, now that you are in the freelance space, um, how, so how then does the choice of music that you choose to cover, how is that impacted or, or or how is that influenced by the publications that you want your work to be seen in? How is that impacted or influenced? I think, well, it's a tough question. I think largely it's about, yes, it's tailoring to your audience and trying to create, um, content around the genres that they're aware of but as okay. I said before it's also about introducing new genres so yeah. introducing that globality to okay. it as well yeah. and I think a lot of the magazines I've worked for they've been really keen to um, integrate more globality of, nice. in regards to music yeah. so whether that's like one of my first articles that really took off was called a tour de French drill and it was okay. Looking back on it, really awfully written. Um, the grammar was <laughs> terrible, but it was like, I guess, an intriguing piece because it gave you a quick pit stop tour on the emerging scene of French drill. Yeah. So sort of finding niche yeah. things like that was a large focus. So, so when you take on a piece like that, you know, in terms of covering or profiling a sub genre like that um, what kind of research goes into that and uh, and um, did you find that you had to reach out to to the artists or was was this was this a case where you had a bunch of French drill artists pitched to you and then you thought okay there could be a story here? I think obviously it can be easier to write from experience and with something like French Drill for example it's not a genre I'm going to necessarily have like integrated experience in at yeah. all so the research is really key and that research yes partly came from the internet I'm a rabbit holer if you can <laughs> call that a phrase I like to I like to spend hours on end on YouTube, deep diving 
any sort of avenue I can get into and yeah. I might be up until 3 a.m 4 a.m wow. just on some weird <laughs> <laughs> just finding some really weird stuff on on the internet yeah. and, and that's usually what inspires or yeah inspires the research um, further another thing is trying my best to integrate and have conversations with people who might have a better knowledge of yeah, that. So yeah. um, I was lucky enough to spend a bit of time out in France, for example, oh, nice. and I got to speak to some friends out there who really knew about the scene. Yeah, so yeah. I would just chat to them on Instagram or oh, something nice. and yeah, just yeah. pick their brains, basically. <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> really, nice. they should get some of the credit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is more like a broad question, but like, you know, for for yourself you can speak from both from both a freelance writer perspective and an editor's perspective as well so you know in your time as an editor when you were managing a team of writers and now at being a a freelancer how much how much how much freedom do music writers generally have in terms of the stories and features that you typically cover? Mm. Primarily, uh, first point, I think as a freelancer, I think the obvious thing is that you have a bit more freedom while also having to sort of balance that with taking the opportunities to expand your um, knowledge as well. So yeah. maybe that's not necessarily going to be those niche um, things you you have more of an expertise in. Yeah. But as an editor, I think it's more about something I said earlier, which was making sure you're exposing your audience to new things. And that also means exposing yourself to genres you might not be so well rehearsed in, yeah. if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the piece that you did on French drill. Mm. Um, putting that to the side, um, whether this was something else you wrote or one of your writers or something that you have read, uh, what typically makes a good music feature or a good music story? 100% the research. Okay. It's the research that goes into it because I think, again, not everyone's going to have uh, an understanding of everyone's experience. So to truly try and grasp a perspective that you might not um, understand, yeah. you have to do the research, you have to sort of try and grasp what led to that story or what led to that creation or development in an artist's craft. Yeah. And yeah, it's re research and just chatting to people who are similar minded as well. I yeah. think that was a major thing for me was just having conversations with people who were similarly passionate or nerdy about things, yeah. just geeking out, basically being unafraid to geek out about <laughs> things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going back to the research, I think that's why I was so honored or privileged to have done a subject like anthropology. So I was never academic at school okay. and that's where I truly, like at university, I started to find a passion for something that was a bit more academic yeah. um, and it's just feeding that curiosity that I had from growing up somewhere. I grew up very isolated area where <laughs> everyone was one track minded yeah. so I think yeah from that it just grew into a huge passion for the research and I think what I'll say to any writer is just do your research because yeah. People will be immensely impressed by that. That's where I've had the best response is when yeah. I've spent an unnecessary amount of hours researching something. But yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> um, so this could go both ways. Let's go with side A first. Um, what, what has been or yeah, yeah. What what has been the biggest compliment that someone has given you about your work? Wow, I'm always surprised when people, firstly, when people come back to me and say they've read a piece because in my head, 
no one reads my writing. <laughs> I think that's what gives me confidence to write. Yeah. But in my head, no one reads my writing. So it's, if it's a friend, if it's a stranger, when I get feedback, I'm like, wait, you read that? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> and I'll start overthinking it. But no, I think the best compliment. Um, recently, I had an artist say, um, they'd read a piece, I'd, an interview I'd done with someone and they felt that the conversation we had really resonated. And that for me was like, wow, okay, I can actually, you know, create a conversation with someone yeah. and encourage people to talk about things that resonate. It's not me personally yeah, that's yeah, yeah. creating that resonation, <laughs> words, <laughs> creating that, um, that feeling. But yeah. if I can get an artist to encourage an artist to share their story in such a way that resonates yeah. with my audience yeah. or with the magazine's audience that's really sick to me that's definitely. yeah that's incredible definitely. definitely um so jumping right into music submissions um what's your inbox like this, these days and how do you manage it oh god how do i manage it i it's a roller coaster right <laughs> my inbox it's Sometimes, you know, you're going through, trying to get through a hundred emails in under an hour because you <laughs> do not want to be sat there all day with emails, yeah. but I will do my best always to actually check every email, um, wow. which means obviously I can't respond to yeah. every single one. So I think it's still, still a journey I'm trying to navigate, okay. um, organizing my inbox, <laughs> <laughs> but I will, yeah, I think it's, the least I can do to try and listen to every music submission. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just organizing my inbox. I think it's being kind to myself as well, okay. that I go through those phases where sometimes I will clear my entire inbox in a day. Yeah. And sometimes things might pile up and I'll just have to be a bit more forgiving to, <laughs> and not create too much pressure to yeah. do it, to, to answer everything. Definitely, definitely. And so like, um, so, you know, as you said, there are days where you get hundreds of emails and, you know, yes, you cannot respond back to every person, but you take the time to listen to stuff. And so, um, is there like a system that you, that you may have where, um, even if you don't cover something now, um, but like you, you, you like it and you probably want to save it and, and come back to it. How does that work? Um, I use flags. So okay, I yeah. use the, the Mac email. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it's the same with Gmail and yeah. stuff, but I'll try and like file things basically. Nice. So if I don't have time to come back to it, I'll sort of create a draft response um, or at least draft uh, without writing the email out. I'll just put it in my draft yeah. and then it just bugs me to the point that I have to deal with it. <laughs> nice. um, I think I get overly concerned about saying the right thing. So whether it's a piece of music I'm not so keen on or yeah. not, um, I'll do my best to try and respond to it as much as I can. Definitely. And definitely. yeah, flags are basically yeah. just... I don't know either it's going to be genre categories or yeah. say oh, nice. i'll put it into like a category where i have a, a file where it's like for interviews potential interviews oh, nice, nice, so i nice. might return to your email a month later yeah. and be like Yo, i'm really sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's just a madness in my yeah. inbox i'm trying nice. <laughs> but i would be really keen to set up an interview now and i have the time to do it nice 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 um so you talked about um, how research is a big part of how your pieces come t come together. Um, do you ever find that the emails that you get can then lead to more of like a broad trend story? So say for Example, um, you get different PR companies or different labels sending you um, music or artists from this very niche genre 
does that then spark up perhaps a a much larger conversation to say okay you know i've gotten like five or six or ten emails this week on this on this sound mm. you know like um can that lead onto a piece or a or a story on that sound i guess to to kind of bring it back around do the emails that you get or do the email pitches that you get ever lead to that to that kind of big trend story or big kind of feature Mm, that's a really interesting question definitely i think especially as an editor you're trying to watch for trends Mm. and things that are starting to crop up more and more before they start getting taken to social media and being talked about on there so emails are actually a good way to do that because you might have sort of rising artists that are they're coming up because of certain themes that mm, are more mm, relevant mm-hmm. to maybe the politics at the time or yeah. anything like that. And then you can, from there, sort of think, okay, I've got a few people reaching out to me about this. Let's make it, yeah. let's culminate it and nice. put it into one big piece because that is a really exciting potential feature. Yeah. And yeah. it's a much more exciting way to grab your audience and get people interested in talking about that certain topic yeah yeah. so whether that was recently this sort of there was like a lot of talk around south asian um the rise of south asian like djs and female djs and and there was a really huge amount of excitement towards sort of giving a spotlight to that um to that subject so yeah it's it's kind of like banking on that and trying to see where um, where the conversation's moving before definitely, it does go definitely, there. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, so going going back again to um, music submission. So for the emails that you get, um, and I know that you say that you try to l- listen to what is being sent to you, but like um, for the emails that you tend to open first or you know or or like how do people's emails stand out to you in your inbox Hmm. is it to do with the subject line or you know the person you know like how does that work in your mind first of all I think as a journalist you're hyper aware of not trying to get grabbed by a headline okay so i'm I'm quite avoidant of that i think um it's not necessarily going to be the subject subject line for me personally i don't know whether that's applicable to any and every writer um but it's more about sounds really lame but kind of how organized the pitch is (laughs) okay if it's gonna be like Obviously, like I said, sometimes you're trying to get through 100 emails in an hour. So <laughs> you learn to skim read. Yeah. And if a, if you've got a pitch that's sort of rambling on, I, I don't mind it. I think it's really cool. It shows you're passionate. You've got a lot to say about yeah. the artist, but I'm not going to really necessarily have the time to just pick up on it like that. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of... Uh, teams out there that send things with bullet points and okay. they'll sort of bullet point the statistics yeah. and the the sort of factual bits okay you know like yeah. the stuff you yes it's relevant you have to include it in the piece because that's the artist's achievement but you're not going to be so passionate to know about that artist mm-hmm. and then maybe have a small two sentence paragraph where you include some anecdotes about okay. the artist i yeah. think that's what really grabs me is just have a little anecdote, something that warms you up, yeah. and then keep the stats in the in the bullet point <laughs> section. That that to me really appeals. But yeah. that might be a personal awesome, personal awesome, take. Awesome. Um, so based on that, or like based on that last question, um, if you can remember what's 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 what has been or what was a really good pitch 
that you received recently from someone that you didn't know? It was a one-liner. I'm not a big fan of one-liners. It feels quite desensitized or like <laughs> lukewarm, but yeah. they said, my rap style is Nicolas Cage meets Seneca. Okay. And I, did, I looked it up and Seneca is some Greek philosopher. Oh, wow. So I was like, okay, I want to hear what this music <laughs> sounds like now. I don't think the conversation went any further, but yeah. um, I'm trying to think. A good pitch, I, I guess, is going back to that, like, the anecdotal bit. I think yeah. if a pitch has something like a bit warm-hearted about yeah, it, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna want to tap into okay. it a bit more and, and gives me curiosity to write yeah. about that artist. Okay, all right. So we have touched on what it, what a good pitch is, what a good pitch uh, tends to look like for you. Um, but what about what a bad pitch would look like for you? One-liners, like literally just here's my music or here's this artist's music I'm working with, um, link, blah, blah, blah. that's it. Like, I, that to me, I, I get it. You're trying to reach out to a lot of people. I completely understand. It's, it must be hell, mm. but it just feels so lukewarm. And okay. like, you, how, how does that translate any passion? Yeah. I yeah. want to connect with people that have just as much passion as I do. <laughs> for sure, for sure, for um, sure. But yeah, I think that's, I don't know, you can't really make a bad pitch. For uh, me, if the music's good, the music's good. Okay. And okay. as I say, I try to listen to, yeah. if not all, the music submissions I get. Yeah. So I've said this to a lot of artists that have thanked me for a piece. If the music's good, the words write themselves yeah. easily. Nice, nice. Touching on that, there was a question that is maybe three or four down, but I'll bring that up now. Um, so, you know, as you said, if the music is good, the words write themselves. And there is also a famous phrase that um, most music journalists will typically agree with, that if they like your music or if I like your music, I will, I will write about it. Mm. But are there any exceptions to that phrase that you, that you can think of? It's a tough one. I think there's integrity as a writer. I find it, again, this might sound a bit um, self-inflammatory. I don't know. Um, I find it really hard to push the button to release an article when I've written about something I'm not too keen on. Okay. Um, if I'm writing positively in a full sense, uh, I think it just feels wrong to me. I, I, I truly try and write things that only about things that I have a curiosity about. Yeah. Um, because I think that will translate in the writing. And Definitely. obviously, when you're writing about music, it's there's kind of a pressure because. An artist has put their heart and soul into that yeah, more yeah. time. Yeah. And you don't yeah. want to be dampening down the passion or the I've overused that word. The, <laughs> <laughs> you know you don't want to you don't want to dampen down the, the creativity that's yeah, gone into that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I get why that there's that phrase um, that you mentioned. It's it is really hard, I think, as writers to write about something you're not too keen on. Yeah. Yes, sometimes maybe as a, an editor in the past, I've had to like push a few things out there that other people I know will like. Mm, just, mm, mm. You, can't, you can't always base things off your own taste. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. You have to think about everyone else's taste yeah, as well, yeah, yeah. which can be hard to tap into. It's quite, it's quite interesting that you took the question that way. I'm going to bring it back round and say, um, would there be or are there any circumstances where you like something but are not able to write about it? And mm. um, what kinds of circumstances would that be? So say bad timing or, you know, you know, you know just, you know, just, just um, what reasons could there be? I think sometimes I get to in my head about 
if I really, really care about that artist or that music has really resonated with me in the past. Yeah. Um, it might be something that I was listening to throughout my teenage years or something, and I'll put too much pressure on myself to write the perfect piece on it. Okay. And get my research just right and not <laughs> not mess it up in any way. Yeah. Um, and it's quite hard to alleviate that pressure. Um, so sometimes I can, you know, reach a block okay. or I can freeze up with yeah, an article yeah. and. I had it recently where it was one of my favorite editorials I did this year and I was writing up the interview and I was really, I spent about three days writing this one article <laughs> and I was getting wow. really frustrated with myself. I was like, do I scrap the whole thing and start again? I don't know what to do. But I think to get past that, it's about taking some time away, write something else okay. and sometimes even just um, maybe you get some inspiration from elsewhere as well. Yeah, I think that's yeah. important. Definitely, um, definitely. Yeah, just cool. read some other cool. people's writing. Nice, nice. So, um, so like you get different publications that have different rules in terms of oh, if the music is um, X Y Z old, we we can't really cover it anymore. Um, do you have those kinds of rules? How, how do so, you mean, so? So, um, so... controversial or...? Oh, no, no, so, 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 so say you get a pitch from an artist and they send you a song or mm. an EP that is four weeks old or like two, that, that is two months old mm. you know you, you know you get different publications that think you know it's now it's it's too late for us to write about this i, I try not to focus on that too much okay i don't know if that was you know the best way to optimize the you know search engine optimization <laughs> algorithm work with the algorithms or whatever but i try to not focus on that too much i would as an editor, I'd make an effort to, and even as a freelance writer, work with features that maybe create a feature that can can actually create a spotlight on something that came out a few yeah. months ago yeah. or last yeah. year and yeah. still try and um, put people onto that nice. because it nice. might not have got the traction it deserved Definitely. at that time. Yeah. And there'll be other things that can uh, you can put the new music into like yeah. playlists or definitely, whatever and definitely, definitely. just play around with having set features mm. that can accommodate mm. for that yeah. as well I think yeah. that was my main way of tackling that issue nice nice, nice, so, nice. awesome whatever. awesome yeah. so um now for this one um not including one-liners and not including Anecdotes, can you tell us what are the do's and don'ts of pitching music to you? Cool. For beyond that, um, <laughs> there's not so much do's and don'ts, I would say. I mean, I think don't sound like a robot if you can. Okay. <laughs> um, it's like receiving cold calls. Like, yes. you don't really yeah. want to be chatting to, you know, someone who's reading off a script. <laughs> that, that feels so empty. So, yeah. yeah, try not to... Try and put a bit of life into it. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe that's too much work because I know... <laughs> I know you guys are stressed already. <laughs> you have one of the hardest jobs in the world. <laughs> but... Yeah, if you can, just just have a bit of fun with it. Yeah, so nice, don't be afraid nice. to like, I don't know. Don't you don't have to be like inviting me out for dinner, yeah. or coffee, but <laughs> try enough. and try and like build a relationship. Yeah, I yeah. think that's the key thing for me is to not be overwhelmed by the amount of people reaching out. I will build a relationship with the ones I feel like I yeah. resonate with the most. Yeah. Yeah. And in yeah. order to find out whether you resonate, I think it's important to just start building a little relationship. We don't have to be besties, yeah, yeah. but we <laughs> we can we can share a little one-liner about our day to yeah, start the email yeah. off and just be like, oh, 
my inbox is horrible right now. Or, you know, just warm it up a little bit yeah. and, and try and just create relationships with people. Definitely, definitely. I definitely. think as well, to add to that, yeah. it helps you then, as a journalist, communicate what you like and don't like yeah. better. Yeah. Because the key thing for me is, as a journalist, I really, really appreciate it when someone reaches out and they've they've actually thought about whether I'd be interested in it or not. Mm, mm. Tailoring your pitches to the people you're reaching out to, I yeah. think, might be out of my realm to say it, but I think that's so important. Definitely. Um, and considering, Definitely. I think, press, they have a better idea of the intrinsics of the features yeah, of yeah. magazines. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe thinking about what feature might fit nicely, whether okay. that's like, a fresh face feature on yeah, Notion yeah. would fit really nicely for this artist, would you be interested? Yeah. And just sort of trying to support each other and Definitely. reduce the work on both sides yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is a good way for nice. moving forward. Yeah without reaching a dead end in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so what is your take on follow-ups? Um, I live in the follow-ups, uh, <laughs> but what is best practice for follow-ups for you? I totally get the reason you need to do follow-ups. Listen, I'm not going to always <laughs> reply to the initial email, um, sometimes I'll put it in my drafts, like I said, <laughs> and <laughs> might get lost in the mix. So I think follow-ups are important. And one thing, if we're talking do's and don'ts with follow-ups, just don't start to get aggressive. I've mm, had sometimes mm. people will be like, why are you ignoring me? <laughs> and I'm just, I don't know how to tell you. I'm not interested in the music without sounding horrible. I, I don't love giving rejection. I'll try to do my best to say it's not up my street. But yeah, I think follow-ups, I get it. I, I get yeah. why they're important and just be, be timely with it. It's very difficult to just say easier said than done, yeah. but don't, don't try and put too much pressure on it either. Definitely, um, definitely. I'm sure you've got your own experience with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, um, for me, right, because I work on the press, on the press side as well as on the media side mm. I have learned to be much more lenient with it mm. um, because you know on the press side that's where that's where we live and that's where we get most of our responses from as well mm. um, so I would so yeah um, but I do agree with you in terms of there's no need to be aggressive in any way, in anything, you know. It really is off-putting, but to emphasize, don't be afraid to follow up. Cool. <laughs> so, um, so, so, um, um, the whole music press space, you know, seems to be kind of moving, moving, moving away from things like exclusive premieres and i say that and it could be back back again in full force so maybe not maybe but okay mm. um what is your take on things like exclusive premieres do they still hold some value for you um you know, yeah and you know um how do you see those i think I, probably everyone's got a different perspective on premieres. Um, mine might be a hot take. I think premieres, I understand why they're dwindling down a little bit. Um, I'll get into that in a second. But firstly, premieres, I get why they're still an important feature to sort of push for because for a publication, it is a great way to create excitement around mm. a, a new bit of music. I think it it adds that exclusivity yeah, and, yeah, yeah. but unfortunately there is like the insidious side of it which maybe I'm not in my right to say but I know <laughs> some places they ask for money for oh, premieres wow. okay. so 
I'm, I'm not too keen on that <laughs> side of thing. And I think that's, that's one of the sad sides that this music industry is taking with things like premieres and exclusive access and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I can understand why some people are a bit resentful or yeah. a bit funny with them. Yeah, cool, <laughs> cool, fair enough. And on the flip side of that, I guess this is not a huge thing in the music press space, but um, how do you feel about embargoes? Do they even work? Do you even care? I think they work, yeah. I think it's oh, one of the first, first things I was really gassed about when I was starting to get emails was receiving stuff that was under embargo. Okay. I don't know, it was cool. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm the only one of the 20 people that are hearing this, cool. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I'm not always going to check things out. Um, as soon as it's sent so unfortunately sometimes I miss the embargo period yeah, and yeah, yeah. then I'll get the reminder the day it comes out and then I'll listen to it and be like oh, damn I could have heard this a week before it came out fair enough fair enough but um no I think embargo is still important but um do they so that like, you know you you just said you know that you know you may tend to miss it right so like do you think they they serve the purpose, right? So you know, you know, when we get an email saying under embargo until Thursday six p.m., mm. I think that the press people would like the media people to publish their piece at six p.m. on Thursday, yeah. but you know, like. It's a good question. I think because I, I really completely understand and, and encourage things to be sent ahead of time because yeah, it yeah. can be really, really difficult to squeeze um, slots into the schedule because mm -hmm. obviously you can't be posting 10 articles Thursday 6 p.m. because yeah. someone's trying to get out before New, new Music yeah, Friday yeah, yeah, yeah. or on New Music Friday when you have a tsunami wave of releases you're not going to be able to um, please everyone mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think as long as like from the journalistic side as long as I communicate to you I hope this is okay yeah. as long as I communicate to you guys unfortunately it won't be able to come out on the onset of the release but we can put it out 12 p.m. the next day yeah um, maybe do like you can try and push for like a story post on yeah, Instagram yeah, or something yeah, like that just yeah, to yeah. start to get the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a tough one. I think it's just trying to be kind to everyone's schedule <laughs> because yeah, there's a lot to try and accommodate yeah, for. Yeah. And sometimes I think that can push people away from communicating properly with um, like press teams and, and managers. I don't know, that Definitely. could be. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so when you have covered an artist, right, um, what's the best way for them to maintain that relationship with you? Ooh, um, God, social media. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how, like, how so? How so? Um, so I think a lot of artists that I've connected with are, you know, there's Initially, a lot of my writing was with artists from abroad. Okay. Um, so I was working with quite a few artists from the US and a way that I kind of connected with them was sort of create an online friendship in a way. Okay. Like, it was almost like being back on MSN days or something, yeah. you know, you're just like, you're trying to keep that like, um, neutral friendship yeah, in a way yeah, and yeah, yeah. whether that's actually communicating to them or just posting some of their music on your story mm. and again it's talking about relationships so I've had a few artists um, who I think they've picked out a few writers um, that they really tapped into trying to build a friendship and relationship okay. with yeah, yeah, yeah. and that for me has been a really wholesome side to it relationships in this industry is one of the most 
vital parts in maintaining confidence and being able to have people you can reach out to, talk to, ask yeah. questions yeah. and yeah. just yeah, talk things through. Definitely. So whether that's an artist or not. Yeah. Yeah. Important. Nice, 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 nice. Um, so in terms of like your music coverage and um, your overview for the rest of the year or, you know, going into 20, 23 or just or just in general are there are there any specific things that you are usually looking for hmm. in an artist yeah i think it's that excitement just if if a new artist seems excited when it's like shaking with excitement like uncontrollably so that's yeah. that's gonna get me excited too nice. that's yeah. gonna get me interested because i know that that passion will carry on into their career yeah and create a longevity for them definitely um and just i maybe it's a overused word but authenticity um people that are not afraid to make mistakes mm. fall on their face mm. and just yeah, just be themselves. Yeah. That's really going to appeal to me personally. Um, yeah, just people who really yeah. get excited and nerdy about things. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so for an artist or a band or a musician that you haven't written about before, mm. um, what ways can they catch your attention more than others um i mean outside of doing my 3 a.m rabbit holes on youtube <laughs> <laughs> um working with so one thing i do is to discover new music if i'm a bit in a bit of a rut i will look at artists i already really love listening to yeah and i'll think about i'll look through the features okay. and people that they've worked with yeah. they, people i haven't heard of because oh, nice. I'll trust an artist's taste over my own taste. They actually have some real intrinsic knowledge of the musicality yeah. that someone can put into um, their craft. So, yeah, featuring alongside other artists, yeah. working together, I think is a nice. great way to get exposure. Yeah, um, It's not something I'm expert in, how an artist gets more exposure. <laughs> Obviously, there's the um, algorithm side of things, but... Yeah, that for me is yeah. the most vital way and not being afraid to talk to the smaller magazines because mm. I will actually always be checking in on like blogs and yeah, smaller yeah. magazines yeah. for what they're paying attention to because yeah. I think they put a bit more time into it sometimes as Definitely. well. Definitely. So Definitely. it's not all about those big features yeah. as well. Nice, 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 nice. Um, well, you know, I guess this this goes this goes back to what you just said, and I guess you can expand on this a bit more. So, you know, um, as a music writer, as a music journalist, as a music editor, um, outside of your inbox um, and outside of those three AM YouTube <laughs> um, things. <laughs> That's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you go to find new music? Hmm. I mean, yeah, like I said, blogs and features. Um, well, actually, a lot of the time, if I'm listening to an interview with an artist, I'll be taking notes of things okay. that they talk about. Yeah. Again, it's me trusting an artist's taste over mine, in a sense. Um, they might be talking about some stuff their mum used to listen to and mm. I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool let me <laughs> let me have a look yeah. and then yeah just getting really into that or it might be um a show on nts vietnamese pop in the okay. 60s yeah and i was fascinated i was taking <laughs> notes of all of the names that i could potentially look up on youtube nice. trying to find um so yeah that but in terms of finding new artists because obviously that's looking into older genres yeah um, again, I think it's just like checking out other magazines, seeing what they're talking about, mm. um, and yeah, seeing what artists are talking about yeah. in interviews and 
definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, so how can artists, labels, PR people, um, or anyone that is pitching music to you, how can they best help and support you in your role? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what I said before, to tap back into that, it's tailoring your pitches to the right people, kind of trying to understand what writers you're reaching out to and where their niche might be or where they might be interested to learn more. Mm. It doesn't have to be what they've written about in the past, but I think you can sort of get a grasp for what people get curious about. And curiosity is the key to everything, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just trying to understand a bit more about who you're reaching out to. Um, and I think that goes both ways for the journalist as well. It's about building that relationship then with the PR so you can come back to the PR and say, this isn't really up my street, yeah. but I'd love to keep hearing more from you because mm -hmm. I think you've definitely got some interesting bits on your roster from what yeah. I can see. Um, so don't be afraid to keep sending stuff over and eventually down the line, you're gonna have that like, immediate sort of okay you understand me i yeah, understand yeah, you and you have a better working relationship yeah yeah i don't know if that answers nice. your question nice, nice. yeah sure definitely um what do you think is the future of a music journalism and b music discovery okay i'll try and answer the hard one first F future of music journalism it's obviously it's shifted so much in the past couple of decades or even past 40 years you could take it back to like journalists in the 80s where they were going on tour uh, with mm -hmm. with the artists and that's mm -hmm. how they get their research done yeah. they'd be interviewing artists on the fly on the tour and just maybe just sat at the back with the groupies or something um, there's some really great films which like illustrate that out there um, so obviously we've already experienced quite a big shift and now it's it's very much on this virtual side of things mm -hmm. so I think in the next few years especially since the pandemic um, there's gonna be maybe more of an emphasis on the internet world for mm -hmm. music journalists mm -hmm. okay. I might sound a bit dated saying that, <laughs> <laughs> the internet world. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, unfortunately, newer journalists aren't going to necessarily get that opportunity to have an all expenses paid trip mm -hmm. to halfway across the world just to get their research done yeah. on a festival. They can literally just watch live streams yeah, or yeah, things yeah. like that. So in that sense, I think that applies to music discovery as well. There's going to be a shift to algorithm based discovery which sounds really boring <laughs> but I guess we have to try and like work our way around it and not swim against the stream too much yeah sort of go yeah. with the flow with that and and um, maybe with music discovery as journalists I think it's kind of our job to maintain that human um, human nature within yeah. discovery as yeah. well and yeah, just yeah. again feed the curiosity in Definitely. people yeah nice 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 um before you go um can you put us on to some new artists that have been exciting you recently and who you think we should be checking out Ooh, i always freeze up at this question i feel like it's like <laughs> literally my job to know <laughs> and it, so many names come to mind um len len's really sick he's okay. he's doing bits and i think he'll He'll be global in the next few months, if not already. He is yeah. global. Um, it might even be wrong to describe him as a new artist. <laughs> and then alongside that, on the UK front, there's Kalisto. Um, he's pretty sick. Uh, Femi Guerrero. Okay. Um, Tony. She's um, released a couple of tracks, which I've was uh, paying attention to earlier this year. I think she's got really cool flow. Um, 
Who else? Uh, on the US side, I've been listening to a lot of this artist called Mercury. Okay. She's like part of the hyper rap sort of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, category is not a fan of them, <laughs> but if, yeah, if you're going to check her out, just a fair warning, it's not relaxed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also, Tia Kareen just released a really cool album. Um, Another one from the US, Hush Forte. He's okay. a really cool R and B artist. Been yeah. about for a couple of years. Nice. Um, what else? On on the French side of things, he's not new, but Atayaba is kind of cropping up again. I think he's really cool. Someone okay. to check out some nice. of his new stuff. I think he's got a track with Saw Baby, which yeah. is it. Oh, nice. nice. Um, oh, God, there's so many names. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, for the Tony artist, how how do you spell that? Is it Tio T O N I? T O N I, but there's a, a full stop between each letter and each okay. capitals. Yeah. I don't know if she's released anything since, but yeah, she had a really cool freestyle come out um, earlier this year. Cool. So, so, that's just someone that came to mind. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. We'll, we'll check them out and we'll, we'll add them all into the description as well um so for the people that want to find you pitch you send you music say hi all that stuff what's your socials oh god i feel really lame doing <laughs> um at sophia dot <laughs> no. so sophia dot nh um for instagram what's my twitter <laughs> sophia nushka i think it's sophia nushka it's my middle name it's a weird middle name <laughs> um yeah, that's it. That's my socials. I was going to say, oh, don't send her your music on socials, but but I didn't ask if you if that is indeed the case. No pitching in the DMs. Oh, uh, okay. You can try. You can pitch in DMs. It's fine. Um, I might just send through my email for you to then kind of send the yeah yeah. <laughs> But I'm really terrible. Uh, my respond times are quite slow. So <laughs> it's just not advised to pitch through my DMs because sure. you might get a response two months later. <laughs> um, it's even worse than my emails. So. <laughs> you heard it already. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us. It's been really lovely talking to you. And Thank you. you. Thank you so much.